In a world where it's seemingly easy to increase prejudice, maybe you've wondered, is the reverse possible? What would it take to help human beings become less prejudiced? I've been asking myself that question since I was six years old. Uh, a little bit because I grew up in the only Jewish family in Chillicothe, Ohio. But, but even more so. Because when I was six, I knew I was gay and I knew I had to hide. I had to hide that part of myself from absolutely everybody. So today, here I am, 61 years old having spent a lifetime fighting prejudice as a community organizer, I'm still asking myself that question, and uh, I'm here to report some progress. Thanks to our team at the Los Angeles LGBT Center. Our team's story began November 2008, Election Day. The lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community expected a huge victory at the ballot box on gay marriage. And then, California voters rejected us. And the LGBT community was shocked and outraged and really didn't know what had happened. And I had an idea that maybe if we wanted to understand what had happened, we needed to go out to the neighborhoods where we'd been crushed. We needed to seek out the voters who voted against us and ask them why they did that. I didn't know if those voters would want to talk with us. But they did. And 15,000 one-on-one conversations later, first in Los Angeles County and then around the country, we started to gain new insight into how to change hearts and minds. By 2015, we were ready for researchers from Stanford and the University of California at Berkeley to measure us in the most rigorous way possible through a randomized controlled trial, they found that our ability to reduce prejudice against transgender people was remarkable. So remarkable that the well-respected journal Science decided to publish their findings. It seems that we're the first to reduce any form of prejudice in a measurable way, in a long-lasting way, with a relatively simple intervention, a 10-minute, one-on-one conversation that we call deep canvassing. What do we do when we're deep canvassing that's so different from any other conversation? I I can show you. Here's Virginia Malacki on our team talking with a voter in Miami. You're not 100% in favor? It sounds like you kind of are moving away from the, the yeah, 10. Where, what way. number feels right for you? A 5? Okay. And so it, so it sounds like that you started, you moved to a 5 because of the bathroom situation. That's right. The bathrooms. There is one thing that disturbed me. Uh, yeah. I don't know if, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a man that is uh, mm-hmm. using his uh, man clothing uh, uh, goes into a uh, uh, lady's room. That I would not like. Oh, cool. where does that come from, that feeling, the understanding? Because I'm from South America, and in uh-huh. South America, we don't like that. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Is that what you refer to as, like, transgender or all gay people, or...? We, we, we have whatever you are, or whatever okay. God made you, and keep on uh, being like that, not try to be, what uh, you said, how to, to be some, something else. Mm-hmm. Tough situation, right? Maybe you'd want to walk away if you were there. But the upside of having a voter use a word like fag is we know they're comfortable enough with us to be honest with us. And that kind of rapport turns out to be essential if we want to change their mind. So Virginia doesn't walk away, but what we've learned is this is a moment where we've got to react. First of all, we've always got to react, otherwise the voter doesn't know we're listening to them and understanding them. But in this case, Virginia particularly needs to react to the ad hominem because we can never let anything like that stand. But notice the choices Virginia makes as they react. Um, Like for me, so so I'm gay. So so you said like 
like fag yeah, earlier. Yeah, 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 I'm gay. Yeah, I'm gay. Tell me, tell me, tell me. What do you mean? I'm just trying uh, uh, to study the person. I'm uh -huh. asking. If you are, you are. Okay. Yeah. God bless you. But uh, why is that uh, it made you take that decision? Because you have a woman body. Oh, uh, yeah. So. <laughs> So for me, it wasn't really a decision or like a, a choice. It was like, this is just who I am. And so my, how I feel is that I love who I love, like for who that person is. And then my, like my body and like gender, right? It doesn't necessarily match the fact that who I feel on the inside, like as a woman or I don't identify as a woman actually. Virginia's just blown his mind with two different decisions. <laughs> Virginia has number one reacted with directness. And simultaneously, number two, Virginia has been kind. That combination of directness and kindness, that's, that's how you or I would talk with somebody who we really care about, right? That's being a decent human being. And what we've learned and what makes these conversations work is when we show up as human, that's when we're able to affect the people we're talking with. Now, maybe you're wondering, who doesn't know that? But the answer would be, uh, most campaigns don't know that. <laughs> if you were to volunteer with a conventional campaign canvas to go door knocking, you'd most likely be given a script and asked to recite it verbatim to the greatest extent possible at every door. Political consultants call this, quote-unquote, delivering a message. But from the point of view of the voter who is the recipient of this experience, you look like a walking, talking robocall, and they disengage and tune out as fast as you or I would, would hang up on a telemarketer. By contrast, Virginia's combination of kindness and directness and listening pulls the voter in and engages him. He wants to talk more. And that's important because right now, Virginia does know that this voter has an opinion. But what Virginia does not yet know is, is that opinion grounded in the voter having any real lived experience with LGBT people? You never met anybody who's, who's gay or transgender? Never like Never? It. never like oh. So we don't usually use the word fag. So well, it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, so, yeah. yeah. Just, I'm losing my, my So just gay or transgender words. Transgender. Yeah. Well I can tell that when you're saying it you're not mean you don't say it with like negative or bad oh, feelings. No. It was just in my so, yeah. in my way of being like you, oh. you just said it. Yeah. Do you remember uh, so one of the things too that why I know it's not really a choice for me is like right now I am madly in love with this person, uh, their name is Lourdes. And Lourdes. Yeah, beautiful name. And they're, they're a teacher and they're gorgeous. And I'd love to show you a picture because you showed me one of yours. There, there wow. there's, that's my partner. I'm head over heels. Like I can't even begin to tell you that I want to spend the rest of my life with this person. Virginia just offered this voter his first real lived experience with an LGBT person. Virginia offered themselves. Uh, Virginia's preferred pronouns are they and them. And what we've learned is that telling our story is absolutely the number two most effective thing we can do when we want to reduce prejudice. Yay for number two! But to go deep, we've learned that we have to go beyond telling our story because we've got to go beyond telling. Think about the last time you changed your mind about something really important? Did it happen because somebody told you to hurry up and change? I doubt it. And so now Virginia is going to do what we've learned is the number one most effective thing we can do to reduce somebody's prejudice. And yes, it's even more powerful than telling our truth. But that sounds like when you talk, like that there's a lot of love in your tone too. Well, so. uh, one thing about uh, love is very, yeah. that's a, a showing. Yeah. 58 years uh, married and now uh, yeah. I have to take care of everybody, really take care of everybody, yeah. everything. 
thinking. Yeah. How does that make you feel? I feel like uh, God uh, gave me uh, still love to uh, yeah. love a disabled person yeah. and care about it. That resonates a lot with me because like, I know that I'm going to, I'm going to take care of Lourdes for the rest of my life. And well, maybe gonna, she will take care of you. I know, well, we'll take care of each other. Well, you just saw the number one most powerful thing in action. Virginia helped the voter discover and reflect on his own real lived experience. In this case, his love for his wife, even as she is physically declining. And, and as he's speaking this story aloud, I, I think what he's realizing is that what he's learned from life about how he wants to treat people is at variance with the opinion that maybe he offered at the beginning. And, and Virginia is going to circle back in a little bit, pretty soon, to see if he sees that connection. But first, Virginia's got to go back to the beginning of the conversation because there's something still undiscussed. When the voter articulated his prejudice, he also articulated a specific concern that included that prejudice, that concern about bathrooms. For me, these laws, and including transgender people, are, are about that. They're about how we treat one another. They may not, um, they may not stop who goes into the bathroom or not. Um, but no, like, because what I say is mm -hmm. that, uh, that a woman that uh, says, I'm a man, you come to urinate next to me, I will move away. In terms of like you moving away, is, that the, is, that, is there anything else you can picture happening? Like, What do you think the worst would happen? It is only the, 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 the feeling that, that uh, one of us uh, doesn't belong there because mm -hmm. uh, you, you are where you are, I'm where I am, so two uh, different feelings. Mm -hmm. So I like to be with my, yeah. like when I, I was, uh, that's the way I was grow up. Mm -hmm. Does it scare you? No. Scare you, the only the bad part. No. Yeah. I think what you're talking to is more of a comfort level then. Like, it's not scary, there you it's go. just comfort. Virginia just moved the discussion about bathrooms from the hypothetical fear to uh, the practical reality. And now the entire conversation is grounded in reality, and this is the moment where the voter gets to put the pieces together and decide for himself what feels true to him. That but I comfort. tell you the truth, uh -huh. this is the first time, Yeah. and I, I thank you, that I could ask questions like yeah. this and, 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 and be responded with yeah. elegance. And, uh, well, yeah, so that's why I'm we're out kind of, here. So, uh, listen, oh. probably I was mistaken. Yeah, like, so the thing about the comfort is that that's all it is. It's this big, because since a lot of people don't know someone who's transgender, there's a, like an, uh, a, a, and uh, like a, I'm not even sure what to call it, but you know, just a, a fear of the unknown. The knowing that like that's what Lourdes faces is why, is a big reason why I'm out here today because knowing when my partner, like, like your wife, right? Like when the people we love are dealing with something that impacts them daily. It impacts you too. Yeah. So I've shown you just five minutes of this beautiful conversation to give you a glimpse of the magnitude of the change that we're able to stimulate. The researchers found that we're having a large impact on one in ten of the voters we speak with. And when they say large, what they mean is that the decline in prejudice against transgender people that we're able to achieve in ten minutes is comparable to the decline in prejudice against gay men and lesbians that took more than a decade. Now, we're still learning. And I'd love to be able to do better than one in 10. But one in 10 is huge. In the short run, one in 10 can be the difference between winning and losing an election. And in the long run, it's even more powerful because it turns out that the impact of deep canvassing conversations persists far longer than any other attempt at persuasion we know of. For instance, TV ads. Their impact evaporates 
in three to five days. But the researchers found that our deep canvas conversations have an impact that lasts at least nine months and maybe longer. They're still measuring. So, consider what it would be like if deep canvassing became a normal part of American politics, if, if more of us and if more campaigns more often went outside of our bubble. That's the vision we find compelling at the Los Angeles LGBT Center, because from doing this work, what we know is people can change, we can help them change, and that means that the total amount of prejudice in American society is not fixed and not inevitable. Maybe, maybe, prejudice itself is not inevitable. That's what I think about every night. And that's what I wondered about and wished for as a boy.